This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Hi, welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today, all the way from the UK, is Alex Ellis. Hey, Alex, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Bill. It's good to be here. Um, looking forward to talking about Go and how it sort of transformed my career almost by, by stealth, completely unexpected, really, when I first started learning this language. Yeah, I, I'm, we're really, I'm really interested in hearing that story and how you got there. Uh, but before we, we go back into the time machine, um, just give everybody the one to two minute kind of um, background on what you're doing today. Like, where are you right now? Yeah, so today I'm, um, I have my own company, a small company that I set up um, and started doing business in 2019 completely, if, if you like, independently of other employment. Um, through that, I'm offering enterprise support for a project called OpenFAS something started now about five years ago. Originally, I wanted a way of being able to run serverless functions with containers, with Git as a source of truth, and all of the kind of things we come to know um, if we look at something like the CNCF landscape. And it wasn't really possible at the time. You're heavily locked into one of the particular cloud providers. It was difficult to move between them. And so I started that project. It's now got over 28,000 GitHub stars, but most importantly, uh, dozens and dozens of end users in production, uh, companies, big and small. And so that that's what I set the company up to do. And then I found out, and as many people that have heard from me before in the past know, there is a bit of a struggle to monetize open source. Um, what a company can get for free, they're unwilling to pay for. And so the journey is then taking me on how to sort of commercialize that, how to learn how to do enterprise sales and pricing, um, and just how to also take take all the knocks and rejections that you get when suddenly something that you've given away for free, you start to add parts to that that are not free. Um, and the way that people that were having a free lunch before and supporting you now maybe change their colors. So if anything, it sort of made me stronger, but I've not always been here, right? You know, I have um, had quite a long past of learning new technology, talking about it on my blog, helping others to understand it, going and speaking at conferences. Um, and that's something that really led me to go as well. Awesome. Yeah, we had a conversation recently with Matt Holt, who I think had a similar journey. So I think as we get near the end of our interview today, and we can talk about some more of that stuff, it'll be, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. It's, it's a super challenge, right? Getting companies to adopt your tech first and then getting them to pay. It's not easy. It's not easy. All right. But before we get there, before we have those conversations, right, we have an hour together here. Um, I want to get back into the time machine and I want to try to have you put some dates and ages around, around some of the questions that I want to ask, just so we have an understanding of kind of the year helps us kind of get a sense of what tech was around then. But I'd love for you to kind of Think back on the very kind of first memory you have in uh, on doing something with a computer that wasn't gaming, let's say, where, where you wrote a program or you did something, with, like something where it was more work than, than gaming, let's say. You know, I think everybody will have experienced some form of uh, console or, or arcade, you know, an Amiga or a Sega Mega Drive, depending and when you were born. But for me, the real interest came about, I think, with um, being able to write my own programs. One of the first ones that I did was with VB3, and I bootlegged it on a floppy disk from the school computer, took it home, and <laughs> developed a, a login screen, just a login screen. Uh, and that is all, all it did was validate your username and password, and nothing else, and it, I found that so fascinating. That, that Christmas, uh, I asked my parents for VB6, for my Christmas present, and it was a bit more expensive than what a lot of uh, kids would have got at that age, uh, but they got it for me. And then I went on to keep developing those sorts of programs at home. How old and, and kind of what grade were you in when you got that bootleg VB3 and you started playing? 
So grades probably don't make a lot of sense to an American audience, but I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, somewhere between 11 and 15, I can't remember exactly. Somewhere but, around there. All you right. know, at what we would call um, secondary school in the UK. Okay. What kind of computer did you have at home? Was it able to handle that BB3 at the time? Or was it like... Yeah, we had an Intel processor um, with Windows on it. And I did used to get it into an unrecoverable state and have to have family come around and fix it. What year? So 11 to 15. What, what, what year did you start university? Let, let's kind of... Did you go to university, actually? Yeah, sure. I went to uni. Um, I mean, to, to touch on what I was saying there, I, you know, I don't want to sort of give away my detailed age and all my records to the whole internet, but let's just say roughly that in secondary school, I picked up VB3, it was the, the language that was around, um, through a news form, I ended up selling a program that printed receipts for somebody who needed a bespoke solution. It wasn't a lot of money, like a hundred dollars, um, supported them with that. And so from very early on, I had that experience. Um, and that sort of interest in being able to create a program, see it solve a problem, or automate something and make it better. Do you remember how much that VB6 cost at that at that point? I think it would have been about £100, because you could get a, like a student edition, maybe that's $150. Oh, that's right. Microsoft used to sell, um, they used to sell... Uh, the student educational things at, at a much better price. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Okay, cool. All right. So you, what, how did you find that job at that age to write that receipt? You, you... I had a connection through a news group. I used to do some answering of people's requests and problems that they had. Um, I don't know if you remember, you used to have a a mail client and then you'd have like a news client. You go in these news groups that are not really don't seem to really be that popular at the moment. Um, and I just got, made a connection with someone, started emailing, and he asked, probably asked me if I could make him a program to do that for his takeaway business. I think he was in Florida. Wow, that's, that, that's awesome. So after you're doing that, um, are you doing more of that in secondary school? Or are, you, are you getting paid to write some software? It was like a flash in the pan, entrepreneurial flash in the pan. From there... Um, I did go on to kind of do a lot more with VB6, develop my own programs, um, and really get a good understanding of what different parts of programming were, like variables and control loops and what have you. Um, I suppose also got an interest in Linux and would th do things like play multi-user dungeons over Telnet, you know, these mass games and go and hack on them they used a language that was a lot like c sort of a cross between c and python i would say and so i forked one and developed my own and extended it and i remember being able to do things like look up an rfc for pop3 or for http servers and write that you know so get a socket and implement the protocol and so doing some things that probably no other 15 or 16 year old would dream of I was thinking the same thing just now. Like you're doing some fairly advanced kind of computing at this young age. And what, what did you run Linux on? Because you you didn't reformat the Windows family computer, did you? Well, I did try to dual boot it a number of times with Red Hat Linux. It would have been one of the early versions. And yeah, off, quite often I'd get it into a mess and have to have someone come around and reformat it. <laughs> Did you get in trouble when every time you did that, or your your Soft family trouble, would just laugh? You know, <laughs> that's funny. Not like yeah, you're not going to get grounded or something, but you, they don't. Yeah, they're not pleased. Was the was the computer at home being used for other things that your your family needed it? Yeah, I mean, to to start with, you just had the one that was shared, and it wasn't until a bit later on that I ended up getting my own. And I wrote a blog in PHP, had a database behind it. Um, I'd seen someone that had done that and there was, theirs was open source or they'd just put it on the internet without a license. I, I don't think anybody was really as au fait as they are today, as well versed as they are today with open source licenses and what they mean, etc. But yeah, I took that as a starting point, built my own, had a database, was FTP'd to a VPS. Um, and... 
I just remember, you know, having a lot of fun with that, hacking on it on my computer, um, and eventually finding out about cross-site um, injection attacks because somebody found a way of getting the admin password from something they'd put into there and putting loads of ads all over it. And so, yes, some sharp edges, but also learned a lot and en really enjoyed what I was doing. How did you discover PHP? Was that at a time when you started wanting to build websites and things like that and getting getting off kind of VB? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think I looked around and that was what people were using. Uh, VB and PHP are very distant memories for me now, though. Because Microsoft had all that that tech as well, right? Which I really played with up until I kind of left Windows in 2013, ASP and... It was similar. It looked similar, right? Classical ASP looked similar to PHP with the um, sort of code blocks mixed within HTML. I guess it would have come down to maybe not being able to run an IIS server on a normal Windows computer, not being able to afford a VPS to run Windows to upload stuff. So Linux seemed to fit pretty well for that. Uh, what else are you doing in secondary school other than computers? I mean, I have to imagine that's not all consuming. I mean, that was the main interest. In the UK, we tend to take all of the subjects up to a certain point and then specialize. So, you know, your standard kind of English literature, language, um, science, electronics, woodworking. Are you active in any sports or music or? So, yeah, I mean, I... I liked cycling. I still like that now. All right, nice. So you're you're going here through secondary school. You're doing some advanced stuff at a young age, um, and you're already kind of involved working on Linux machines and things like that. So I guess when you got to start thinking about next step after secondary school, you're thinking university. Are you thinking computer science degree? You're thinking a different sort of engineering degree. What's what's kind of going through your head as you're finishing up? Yeah, I mean, um, I went on and did a computer science degree, took a gap year as well and did some work at the school because one thing I remember is that um, towards the end, sort of about 15, I won a series of competitions for network support and engineering where you would have to set up, you would basically get a, a sheet telling you how the systems needed to be put together right down to the VNets, IP address ranges and operating systems so i won ran won a number of competitions in the uk and got put through to travel to seoul and go and represent the uk and what you would do is you would turn up and you'd have to perhaps install windows on one computer create an active directory go and install linux on two others recompile the kernel for a video driver um, set up specific services and in the end they they said i was too young uh, they thought I was going to be too young to cope with it. So they deferred it a year and I did a bunch of training with a, a local trainer um, and then went on to um, Switzerland. And so it was called the Skills Olympics. And this was something where you had bricklayers and you had um, woodworkers, electricians, hairdressers, beauty therapists, and you know IT and networking was one of them. And so rather than having something that was sports Olympics or theoretical, it was all about vocational skills. I've never heard of this before. Is this still something that's... It possibly is. It's called the World Skill... It was called the World Skill Olympics, and it was sponsored by the Prince's Trust, so Prince Charles's Trust. I'm pretty sure that we met him. Uh, he came out and met us. And when we were training, they did a lot of uh, um, sort of team building stuff. So we were there to give each other moral support because it was a five-day competition, um, quite strenuous. We had matching training and um, out-of-hours kit, and then we had matching suits. So when we travelled there, 30 of us, we were all suited and booted, uh, looking exactly the same, uh, bunking up in Switzerland and going every day to the competition, coming back and eating together. And it was, you know, just like I imagine an Olympic team would train. This is amazing. This is a, I, I've never even heard of this. Is this something that was kind of well known at the time, or how did you stumble upon this to even get involved? I think one of the teachers recognised a few of us that had potential. 
and said, would you like to go to this regional competition and um, set up computers with us? Now, at the time, I told you about that software I sold, other people wouldn't take me seriously as a programmer because I said I was too young, right? Even when I applied for internships or volunteering, you know, you're too young, 14, 15, you just can't do this. And so I really got into networking and Linux and PC maintenance. I used to fix computers at the school and earn a part-time wage doing that. Um, at one point, we uh, I found a workaround for the proxy server at the school that blocked certain sites and became everybody's best friend as I gradually um, let them on to how it worked. <laughs> Here, 20 bucks, I'll get you through that IP address. Uh, it wasn't for <laughs> money, but, you know... Um, Kids that like computers don't tend to be good at making friends, so it was very useful. So then I went on, um, you know, carrying on using the internet unfiltered, and there wasn't a lot on there in those days. I mean, I'd go on and look at um, Andre Agassi and download like pictures of him playing tennis and stuff like that, and there was GeoCities. And then the headmaster basically did a I'll see you in my office kind of thing, and me and some of the others that I'd helped do this were put in front of him and all the teachers in in uh, an assembly room, you know, massive hall, uh, sort of sat looking at them and basically got addressing down about it. Um, they really weren't impressed. But then on the flip side, they actually said, well, you know, what we want to do is create a computer club where you can take these skills that you've got, this, this sort of uh, interest and apply it. And so what we had was we had three IT rooms and we would have to go and clean the computers. There was a special foam spray. You'd use it on the, the keyboards and the screens, a different spray. Hoover, uh, collect everything away. And then we get to play Network Doom. Wow, this is amazing. How did, how did you, how many years did you go and compete and how did you do at the, even at that early age? So the, the Skills Olympics was from, I don't know, maybe 15 to 17, something like that, you know, since I'd been involved in the program doing the local um, um, tests and what have you. Uh, I went out there, did really well, came in the top five. Most of the people there, I think I was still 16. Most of the people were sort of in their mid-20s and had been working in the industry. And there I was at school learning Linux and networking and how to fix PCs in my spare time. How did you feel, like, at the, at just knowing your age and who you were at the time, being young like that, how did you feel doing that well and, and looking at all these other adults, right? I think uh, I, I felt good about it. Yeah, I felt really good about it. So I, I would almost imagine me at like, if I was like 16, having that kind of success already against industry level people, I almost start thinking, why do I even have to go to school? I'm already here. I can go get a job. Like what's, is any of that going through your head at this point? Because you seem to already have skill sets. I mean, it works differently in the UK. I mean, we, when we say school, we mean something different to in America where school means university. Um, so for school, compulsory education is probably six to 16. And if you're smart until 18, where you have uh, your, your sort of final exams. So I went on and did a, a double qualification in IT and we were doing silly things like how to write a letter and format it and how to do Excel formulas and what have you. And so obviously that that was kind of easy, but not that interesting to me. And I just invested more time in that other stuff I was doing. I ran a, an I-386 on the network. There was a computer room I'd go up to and hang out in, just a little cupboard. And I would have that in there running Linux 24-7. I installed a, a MUD multi-user dungeon, like a role-playing game on there. And people from the internet could connect to it. And I remember one day, um, the IT engineers called me into the like their head office. And they said... Uh, we've been seeing you playing these games and reading what you've been messaging people on there, um, you know, my friends, and they'd been snooping. And that was when I learned that Telnet wasn't encrypted and that you could just install a program and read whatever traffic you wanted off the network. Oh, wow. That your heart, your stomach must have just fell on the floor. Now you're thinking about all the things you've messaged for the last six months. <laughs> Having chats with your friends and what have you and playing a game and... And so that that really sucked. 
but just like um, some of those other lessons that I've had along the way, they they help, they inform you, they give you resilience. Um, and, you know, I do believe in having a go and failing and then asking for help and using that to inform. And like we mentioned, you know, current day with, with sales, there'll be a company that's using OpenFAS in production. They ask you about the cost of a, a pro license. It seems that they really need it and they stop responding to you or they say we've evaluated it we don't we're not going to pay for it and what have you and so everything sort of builds you up to that to the point where you have that resilience and you've got to believe in what you're doing in order to keep going and keep learning I had bad had a bad day during that contest and I remember my trainer had said to me um don't look at what anybody else is doing during the exam right you need to think about what you're doing, what you've set out for that day, how far you are along. And if somebody looks like they're finished, they might have finished and got it all wrong. You know, you need to continue and stay in the game until you've completed what you're doing. Um, and that that's something I apply now. I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of people have, have sort of posted some, I don't know if they're sort of trolling, but you know, OpenFAS doesn't have the adoption of Lambda. Most companies will be adopting cloud functions. Like, yeah, good. They probably should be. The idea here is that what I built was a ability to run in containers, functions in containers, and to also be able to have portability, to be able to go and run for longer timeouts, to be able to tune stuff and build new integrations. If you're connecting a couple of AWS services together, you probably should use Lambda. It will be easier for you to maintain. It will do the job better. OpenFAS exists for people that need it. And there's this narrative in the industry about winning and losing of this container wars. We probably have service mesh wars. Um, I saw somebody talking about Kubernetes policy wars with Caverno and OPA. It's just a very outdated, irrelevant kind of um, viewpoint to have. Think about Simon Sinek's book. He talks about start with why. Why are you doing something? And the idea that a game, well, really, it's about staying in the game and continuing to be able to serve a community or a purpose and not about outright winning. Because if you've won today, great, congratulations, Azure Functions. What about tomorrow? You know, who's the winner then? And what about in six months? So I think there's a lot of rhetoric that is tired and unnecessary. Um, and misses the point about what people are actually doing, why they're doing these things. No, it's uh, everything you're saying is true, right? I mean, from a business perspective, you're you want to kind of be in the market first. You want to get that lead, but it's exhausting to stay there, right? And then you you eventually have legacy, and somebody else gets to come in and rewrite everything from scratch at some point because they're starting. Up. But it's exhausting, right? And so I. I do love that the advice you got about don't don't be looking at everybody else right now. You don't even know how what the quality of that work is. You focus on your own quality and and then you you, you play that out essentially, right? I, I think that's an amazing sort of way to stay focused and not lose heart that you think the perception of everybody around you, wow, that's I'm gonna remember that. We gotta get that in the show notes. <laughs> I don't wanna forget that. All right, let me get you back now. You, you, you decided you're gonna to go to university. Um, t tell me again what you decided you wanna study in university and how long you end up um, kind of going through all that. Well, it was clear that it was going to be computer science. I mean, that was the only thing that, that, that was a programming course in those days. Uh, and a, you know, a, a BSc is what I targeted. But before I got there, um, I had, you know, I had my grades. I knew I was going to get a get an offer at a university. Visited a few with my parents, and decided to take a gap year because I didn't feel that I was ready to just launch into that. And during that time, I continued to work with the IT staff, doing what you probably call sysadmin type of work, um, earning some money. And then I took all of that money, and a friend of mine told me that he'd learned French and Spanish and gone and done the Camino of Santiago of the Way of St. James, uh, an ancient walking route in the north of Spain, 500 miles, 1,000 kilometers. And so I was very interested in languages. I'd learnt um, Spanish at school to a rough level. Uh, I then went back and brushed up as best as I could, learnt some French, 
and German. And as I went out there, the sort of the time of my life, walking on my own, meeting people on the way, uh, socializing and um, just really building some great experiences, walking, just having a backpack, uh, a couple of changes of shirt and trousers. And that was it. That lasted 30 days. Not knowing every day what was the next day was going to bring. Like you had no real plan other than you wanted to get to a certain distance, right? In a certain amount of time. So they were called things called refugios or refuges. And they were either monasteries, sports stadium, uh, sports halls, uh, maybe a church or something like that, or a little hotel that had been converted into a big bunk up place. Uh, very rough. You know, and the first night I remember being there in the place called Ronces Vias, and they had um, fleas in the bed. I remember telling the hospi hospitaleros about it, and they were like, uh, "Yeah, um, in very rough conditions, very cold shower, no hot water." And I thought, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, and then the first day of the walk is just up, 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 a very steep round, um, and through the mountains, basically through the Pyrenees, and incredible views. But that's where you start to meet the first few people and make friends with them, just like people that may have gone to an event like a KubeCon. And the thing is, you're all in the same boat together. And I think when you realize that and you start to identify with other people as equals and going through a common experience, you build closeness very quickly. And so I'd make friends and perhaps see them for three days in a row and then not again for two weeks. And then you would bump into them again and it would be really exciting um, and you'd be very happy to see them you walk together and basically yeah you wouldn't know what the next day would come other than you would be washing your clothes that night cooking for yourself bunking up and in the morning you'd have those clothes on your backpack trying to dry them in the sun walking another 30 to 50 kilometers uh, and then doing the whole thing again did you have was i mean okay the, the question i have is eating and, and buying stuff right like so did you, do you budget like 10 pounds a day or something and, and you just have? It probably was about that because I was very cheap back then. Um, you know, I, I can't say quite why, but I mean, I just I just was. So I would be paying three to five euros a night to stop over in a refuge and then on food, very, very little. I think I was probably vegetarian at the time. Um, and so I would go buy some lentils, some pasta, cook it up. Some, some vegetables and yeah it was very frugal um but yeah it worked i survived and um actually after i'd done that i came back and then i went off to university and uh, started my degree it sounded like in the beginning of that journey it was really rough for the first day or two maybe you thought about what what am i doing and you persevered you got to the end and you must have felt really proud of yourself to kind of finish that. How much of that trip still carries on now from like kind of university up till today? So I, I'm not in touch with any of the people that I met there, um, but the kind, of, the kind of people that you meet, as I say, are just on a, a level playing field with you. You make quite um, strong bonds with folks. You're basically just, doing life together you have very little to think about you've got very little material possessions on you i had a mobile phone and in those days it was basically off for 30 days in my backpack i never turned it on if i needed to um just wrote updates to my family on this php blog that i'd written and people could follow along with that and you used to go to internet cafes that's kind of how things were back then i mean you're spending a lot of time kind of alone in your head with your own thoughts too for 30 that alone must also just help you kind of decompress from the world for a little while. Yeah, it could do. I mean, I think if people are interested in the Camino of Santiago, there's lots of blogs and journals about it now. Go and have a look about it. There's even books about it. But for me, I thought I was going there on my own. And then I realized that you're with people all the time. And somebody that I met on day one, I walked, I walked with until I finished the Camino. And we went into Santiago together, uh, queued up for the church, they swing a big incense around for the smelly pilgrims uh, and then we went our separate ways. So it, you may think it's lonely and that you're on your own in, in your journey, um, but there's so many other people around and we're all so alike. Wow.
All right, so you go back now and you do your university degree in computer science. You're so advanced at this point. Did you feel at any time that the degree was a waste of your time? Or did, what, what, what is it that you learned? So there's three years to a degree, a, a bachelor's in England. And um, in the first year, some fundamentals, you know, we did um, algorithms and data structures. Now that involved doing formal proofs which got my head in a twist um, and actually understanding uh, the, the, o, the O notation and not just being somebody who hadn't done the course, was at work, had a program that was running slow and had to Google it and, and try and guess what it meant from Stack Overflow. You know, I'd had to, to be put through the classes and the tutorage to figure out what it was and try and understand it. Um, you know, is it N log N? Is it N log N or you know, um, and also the data structures are really useful because that was something that I, you know, I, and I don't think I even need to really do it now, build my own data structures from scratch, but having the understanding of how they work and why that was really good stuff for me where it was less useful was I remember in, I think the second year there was object oriented programming class. And uh, I, I just went to the tutor because we had to print out pyramids in ASCII. You know, you'd put the number in and in Java, you'd write the code to write a pyramid in ASCII of that many lines or that sort of size. And I said, look, this this is just really not engaging me. You know, I, I've been programming for a number of years. Um, I'm not getting a lot out of this. And he said, well, uh, let me have a think about it. And he got back to me and he said, well, what I want you to do is special project you're going to mark the other students' work. They're going to build these pyramids and one thing or another. They'll submit the source code to your server. You will load it, execute it, validate the output, and uh, also provide the, the inputs, right, so that you can test it. And we're also going to randomize it, so your program needs to be able to uh, figure that out as well. And had a lot of fun doing that. Loads of fun working with subprocesses, um, files, um, just really getting into it and at the end of it he gave me 98 percent and i said why didn't you give me 100 percent? i've worked so hard on this i've done everything that you asked for um and he said i don't want you to get a big head so <laughs> but i mean that was very sweet of him and i'm sure there's universities where they would just go you know that's just the way it is you've got to do it and there's so much in life that's that way there's so much and sometimes you've just got to suck it up and get on with it because that is the only way to get to uh, what you actually want out of life or what you want out of your career. No, but that was fantastic that the teacher saw that in you and and gave you something more challenging for you to work on. Uh, that, that, that's awesome. Uh, you finished that degree, right? And now I guess you're thinking I'm going to get into the workforce. What, what kind of companies were you thinking about or looking at as you're finishing up that degree and, and what were what were more of your interests in terms of computing at that point? It's a good question. I think, um, you know, university was, it seemed like a very long time, particularly in the second year where we did a group project. And I don't know, I'm sure anybody listening to this, maybe even yourself that's done group work voluntary in voluntary groups before, there's always someone that ends up doing 80% of the work and the others maybe do the 20%. And then there's some people in the group who just blag their way through it. And I was just obviously quite high performer, really focused quite far on in what I wanted to do and found that very challenging. I you know, really struggled with it. And that again was a good learning experience. It was good for me to go through that in that controlled environment instead of waiting until work where whatever you say could end up in you being the one that get fired gets fired right or you being identified as the one who's uh you know causing trouble so yeah i do remember that and some other other stuff where we'd work in groups and perhaps other folks wouldn't pull their weight later on in my career um i remember sort of approaching things from a point of influence so trying to build influence with people for projects internal projects i wanted to start perhaps going and um, finding a couple of other people to get involved with it. But back then I just didn't have those skills or experience. And really you're starting at the beginning. So I think any course that has that practical element to it um, is very important at that young age to kind of learn the realities of work and 
the imbalance of things at times. I have a 10 year old at home who has to do these same things already too. And she'll come home sometimes complaining because they're in a group of five and she's like, this person didn't do anything. And I had to do all this work. And because she cares about her grades, like she's somebody who so much cares about her grades that at some level, if you don't want to do it, get out of my way, I'm getting the A. And then she has to kind of come home and vent about it. Yeah, I can relate to that. For me, I wanted the grades because I wanted to prove myself, you know, like I'd done with the um, the Skills Olympics, like I'd done with uh, just getting into the university and getting my grades. I wanted to do the best I could do, like that 98%, the, the 2% hurt me at the time. It wouldn't bother me now. But then it was like, well, I've done everything I can. Surely I should get 100%. And so when your mark my mark at the time was subject to five six other people's performance and, and interest that was difficult uh, but that was very early on you know these skills you you build up you learn and you understand you know what is reasonable as an expectation i remember being coached by um, a guy from our, our church in peterborough he used to work in london in the city would buy me lunch which was great as a student because i was very i was very cheap very poverty minded I uh, didn't have a lot of money at all. Um, and he would buy me lunch and I'd love that. And then he would coach me and say, well, look, that's unreasonable expectations. You, know, you need to approach it this way or have you thought of it that way? And because he worked in um, in the banking industry, he basically knew that stuff like the back of his hand and really helped me. So as you're graduating and looking for work are you thinking like you don't want to be in a group environment at some level are you thinking like uh, i know i'm going to be more successful if i can be more of an individual kind of contributor in a sense of what i want to do like did that bad experience kind of lead to where you wanted to go as i said with other things i've done in the past having setbacks and difficulties doesn't mean that it, that it's something that you shouldn't do it's just part of it you know failure is a, a form of feedback we didn't fail at the project. It was actually Cluedo. Uh, I think we, as a group, had one of the best ranking projects or best scoring projects. It's still on SourceForge to this day. And last year, somebody even asked me for technical support. I think it was uploaded in 2005. I've never been touched since. Um, and it was great. I was very proud of it. It had um, custom JSON serialization. And um, I remember the networking that we built into it and the AI uh, had a load of fun with it. And then in the third year, I went on to build a, a piece of software that would help you to match students that hadn't got into their primary choice universities with what was available. And every day universities would post on their websites and the software would scrape it, index it using um, something called inverse document frequency, term frequency by inverse document frequency that you probably see in Lucene and different search engines and Elastic. Um, and then there was a desktop app that would be able to pop up and show you a bubble, you know, or you've got a match and click on it and find out. So that was something that I did independently and obviously I had a lot more control about that. Uh, but then I was kind of reporting to my supervisor who would come with his feedback and have his sort of red lines on stuff that I'd done and an influence into that. So I think overall it was a success. Overall, we did really well. And then I went and just applied for a few jobs, ended up getting one in London, which meant doing a three hour round trip every day. Um, now that was pretty tough, but you know, my friend that um, from family friend, that he was going in every day as well. And sometimes sit with him, read the paper together. Um, and catch up. So that job started as a digital agency and it was writing C sharp. I had not done that before. I'd written Java and all those other languages. So it was very easy to switch. And then I started working on projects independently and in groups, doing pair programming, basically we called it XP back then, um, test driven development, really getting into all of that kind of stuff. And how long were you with that first company? I think it was a couple of years before they they sold off and uh, it, it moved to a different city and I didn't want to do that. Then I ended up at a company called ADP, which you may know from the US, one of the top payroll providers, and uh, basically doing pretty much the same work, but on their payroll platform for a good deal of, good deal of time there. 
what kind of problems did ADP have you solving? Was it, was it on the front end stuff? Was it back end? Like, you're working in C sharp over there, right? So, like, what problems? One of the things I did a lot of work on was uh, WinForms application, and um, it would involve me learning a lot about solid principles, OOP, and then going applying these patterns to the code, refactoring it. So it was a bit of a mess when I got to it. I started working with a guy in the US, um, so we had a bit of overlap on time, and then sort of building influence with him. Um, seeing what his strengths were, what mine were, finding a way to work together, divvy up, divvy up what we wanted to do, deliver that to test and build engineers. Uh, that eventually got to customers, get feedback, and I worked on that project for a couple of years. Before then, I think doing a bit more on back end and the web, the web element of it, um, and really probably stayed at that company far too long because what we were told was that it was the best wage that you will get in Peterborough and you know if you if you want to go to London obviously you've got to factor in the train costs which were probably I don't know ten thousand dollars a year it was a lot of money to go in um, all that travel and I was feeling quite thankful to be working close to home so I stayed there for quite a long time thinking that uh, my choice is really limited and then I got interested in docker and really um, writing lots of sort of um, examples and stuff like that with a Linux. I got an Intel Nook at home and installed Docker and started to figure out what it was good for. Came into work and found ways to apply it. So what I wanted to do was use it there and I needed to find a way of applying it that made sense to the other people in the company. And there was very little really that where it would fit, but there was some Selenium testing for doing browser testing you know, for automated tests. So that was an area where I was able to use Docker to spin up browsers, um, do stuff with Jenkins, and start to introduce the idea. So uh, let me. Ask, so when you were at ADP, it sounds like you were there for like five years or something. Was it? It's closer to ten. You know, and that's what I mean. I stayed there almost an embarrassingly uh, embarrassing amount of time. But when I started getting really into Docker, what happened was. Uh, I realized that my colleagues in the US were getting paid three times as much money as me. I also realized that um, I really preferred working with Linux systems and with um, different programming languages. I taught myself Python, Node.js, Go. Um, and at that point, I just started finding ways of learning on the job. So we had probably 300 different DLLs to build that all had to go in a special order and they were manually inputted into a system and so every time a new project was introduced it would break the build and someone would have to raise a request to change the manual order uh, and I found a way of using Go to spider the file system, pull in all of the projects, parse them, figure out the order dependency by walking through it with things like Dijkstra's shortest path that I'd learned at university and produce this final build order that could then be used to, I don't know, create a batch file and, and do the build in a much more efficient way, or even parts of it in parallel. So let, let me get the timeline back a little bit, because you're, you're at ADP for 10 years. Docker kind of becomes publicly announced around, what, 2013 or something like that. So are you starting to play with Docker at ADP? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was saying. Yeah, Docker and Go and and really getting into Node, going to local user groups, um, starting public speaking. So this is around what? Is this around 13, 14, 15? Probably 2015, yeah. And then some stuff before that. I mean, I, I can't remember when I started my blog. It might have been 2013 that I started my technical blog and started writing about Node.js and Raspberry Pi. But yeah, the Docker stuff was probably 20, 2015. The Go was not long after that. And that was because... I wanted to contribute to Docker and be a part of that because I was so influenced by it. Um, they'd found some training materials that I'd written up and asked me to become part of their captain's program, which is like an inf a voluntary influencers thing. Um, and then I started to get more opportunities. I started to get to know people like Justin Cormack, then an engineer, now the CTO of the company, um, and a lot more of the Docker captains, all of whom were independent contractors, more or less.
So, I actually, I have two questions before we move on there. Did, did you find any resistance in ADP to bring in all this new tech? Because I find that a lot of these bigger companies get really established, and it's hard to kind of bring in this new tech, but you were bringing it in. You were able to start learning this stuff and start leveraging it. I, I, th I find that really, I find it positive. No, so I did all of this on my own time, and that was the way that I was able to um, to get some of it in, was by going deep on this in my own time, which I was in control of, find out what it was good for as a technologist, maybe write it upon the blog, but knowing the company and the teams and how they thought and, and what their opinions were, I was then able to find ways to slip things in. So docker into the selenium testing because of the pain it resolved for them uh, go for this big build order dependency problem because of the pain that it solved for them and i think when you have people that are busy um and you're taking care of this thing um sometimes they don't care whether it's been written in go right? because as far as a concern you've been there nine years you're probably going to be there another 10 um, if you leave they'll figure it out so that was how I how I started, and then I actually um, had another use case. We were using Jenkins, and it was very tedious to set up new builds, and we couldn't use the infrastructure as code because of some reasons that existed. So I wrote a Go program to template a new project that people could then we could then use the Go API HTTP SDK sorry to post that to Jenkins and create the job for them. So you could create a definition saying what your jobs were, where they were in source control, what the order was, run the program. It would talk to the Jenkins server, set everything up for you, and then you just click build. And again, because of how fast it was to work with Go, you know, structs, JSON, the HTTP stack that's built into it, that was something that um, started to show promise. And what I did at that point was go to the, the VP of engineering, who was my boss, and I said, um, I want to show you this idea. This is a problem we have. This is how painful it is. This is the solution that I see. Here's one person that has tried it, and this is what he said. And that's when I started to understand how to sell right, ideas and how to market things. And also, what you might sell and market on Hacker News, great, you know, is that going to work inside a large enterprise company where people are against change? No. So it's a very different tactic and set of skills. So, yeah, that's absolutely true, right? You've got to play politics in there. You've got to ease it in. You've got to find champions uh, who are above you that want to champion this. And you have to kind of build it out first at some level to just so people can feel it and see it, right? Like you learned all those skills near the end of, I guess your time at ADP, but what makes you finally leave? Where do you go after ADP after 10 years? Well, look, I mean, while I was at ADP, I I, I got connected with another guy who was really into Node.js and we found Learn You Node. And what we did is we, we said to the VP, we said, can we do a voluntary course on work time for one hour to teach people Node.js? There's this program, here's how it works. We've both done it. He said, yeah, he gave us a time. We did an initial session. And they liked it so much, we got to do it for everybody in the company, in, the, in that office. That was an example that I then used to make a case for teaching people this job generator in exactly the same format. So I wrote the training and I got them to do it, got the buy-in. And then with Docker, the same. You know, I wrote my own labs, made sure they worked on our restricted environment, and the same. And by showing that you're capable of training and uh, explaining and applying in a sensitive way, is how I got a lot of those opportunities. And then the Docker Captains program opened a lot of doors for me. I went and did some travel to the US um, that Docker helped fund some of that. Um, and that's where my eyes, I say, got really opened. People on three to four times the salary I was on, maybe even more than that. And I'd always felt underpaid. Having been there for 10 years, well, nine years, I definitely was underpaid. You know, I knew people at least in the next company were getting double. And as somebody who was doing all this extra work, I wanted to be paid market rate. So I stayed, I stayed, and then I started building things with Go and with Docker. So OpenFAS, this functions as a service. And speaking about it at DockerCon, in fact, I went and did a keynote in front of 3,000 people. 
and I remember the VP coming to me and saying, um, you know, you enjoy this. This will be, you know, in a good, he meant in a good way. So this is probably a once in a life op- lifetime opportunity. This is huge. I'm very, you know, I'm very happy for you. Go and enjoy it. Um, and I came back and got a small, oh, well, I got a promotion to a principal level, a small pay bump, not what I wanted, but a small bump. Um, and I found out that other parts of the company would had an innovation group where they were using Node.js and AWS and containers. And we got talking and I remember applying for a promotion to move to that group. And everything looked very good. Uh, the salary was going to be beyond my expectations. And it was all lining up, talking to HR. And then I was called into a room um, and there was a phone there and and... The, the guy said, pick up the phone, and it was the boss's boss. And he said, I've heard that you've been having some conversations. I've heard that you have been trying to move groups. Um, you're never going to be a chief architect. Never in your life. You're not cut out for it. You just are not the material for this. And um, I was like, wow. And so, I just didn't know how to take it. Long story short is I just knew that I, I had to stop trying to prove myself at ADP, stop trying to win approval, quit trying to play the political game and just go out of there because that was how I was going to get to the next level. That's how I was going to be able to do what I wanted to do. James, uh, Justin Cormack at, at Docker met me at one of the, the DockerCon parties, after parties, and this is where a lot of these conversations happened around these events. And he said, look, you just got to quit your job should be working on open fast full time there's all these people using it you need to be helping them um, I spoke to my wife and she said uh, yeah I think he's right you need to do that and so I didn't know how and eventually ended up at a KubeCon event uh, spoke about open fast there and I'd made some connections with VMware with Spotinst with Mesosphere and all these different companies and had about four or five offers either acquisition or some kind of aqua hire with them. And one of them was for several million dollars, right, in 2017. Um, And I remember phoning my mum and telling her, you know, I was on the cow train, you know, somebody's just offered this this amount of money to me, just had a coffee with him. They want me to bring OpenFast to the company. And um, just the kind of thing I never thought that would happen to me, something that's from the Silicon Valley TV show. So... In the end, one of the conversations I had was we'll give you a whole bunch of stock and you keep everything and just work here. We'll build a team for you. We'll hire them um, and you keep control of the project and you get to work on it full time. You you don't have to give it away. And I thought that was the best thing for the community, even though it wasn't the best thing for me financially. And that's what I did. And that was with VMware. Now, I was with them, um, had a team three junior developers one was an intern and we did some good work in that year it really moved the project on and being able to focus on it full time um, without having any other work or commitments was really good for the project and what we were able to achieve however um, you know having three juniors on your team I don't know if you've ever been in that position there's a lot of training and onboarding teaching them go teaching them Kubernetes, teaching them how to do public speaking, other things that are expected out of the organization. And so um, having to be a full-time coach meant that it also slowed down what I was able to do on the project. Um, And towards the end of the the first 13 months, Google announced a project called Knative, which again, going back to this winning or losing rhetoric, um, VMware very much believed in that kind of play and that kind of game. They'd seen what happened with Docker Swarm and Kubernetes and they thought right if Google's doing something we've got to get out of whatever we're invested in and focus full-time on that which is what they did and so I ended up having no way to fund my work on OpenFAS and no way to keep the project going and none of the open source users and none of the commercial companies that were using in production cared about that you know they just kind of expected it to continue to be maintained to that high standard without any kind of financial input into it even emailed the top companies that you'll see in the adopters files and they were like no we we're just not interested um you keep doing it for free so um it was difficult that was 2019 okay i'm gonna i'm gonna stop you for a second because i want to talk about that but i want to i just i want to 
go back in time just a tiny bit here. Back in like 2015, I had a need for functions, right? Server fun. And I found a company called Iron.io. I loved the company, I loved the people there, and I loved the tech. And we were, we were using that tech like in 2015. Um, you know, we had these asynchronous jobs that we had to execute, and they had all the infrastructure for it, and we could run it on-prem, right? And this is even before Amazon and Google had this tech anyway in their cloud. Like, these guys were ahead of their time. And they built that tech based on customers that, you know, they were like a consulting company, so they had customer needs, they developed a product. So my question to you is, what made you start building OpenFast? What, what was the problem that you saw and the tech that didn't exist that originally made you start building this tech. And I'm guessing that was in 15, 2015 is when you started building this tech. Late, probably late 2016. And as I explained earlier, uh, maybe maybe uh, it wasn't clear. I needed a way to run serverless functions in containers that didn't exist at the time. Nobody was doing it in that way where we could leverage the work that Docker was doing with networking and multi-cluster and swarm, be able to schedule the containers. Um, a few people had a go at it, where they were running the container and then making it shut down and then trying to have it restart. And it took far too long. You just could not cold start a container. It didn't make any sense. And so the way I went about it after sort of sitting down with Justin Cormack and scratching our heads together was um, having this idea of a, a, what was called a watchdog. So Swarm didn't support sidecars, none of this kind of stuff like you see with Istio and service meshes. We needed some way of having a PID zero, an init process that was able to receive a request from a HTTP caller, marshal it in some way into a program and get a response back out. And it looked a lot like CGI bin, right? From my PHP days. And so I wrote a Go program that was very similar to that. For every request that was coming in, the headers would be marshaled as environment variables, the body is standard in, the production from the function is standard out back to the HTTP server to whoever called it. And so you could wrap something like um, cat or uh, cal or date or something as a function, right? Something that didn't have a HTTP stack. Uh, very similar to INETD in, in Unix then needed a, a way of orchestrating how to run these containers on, at the time, Docker Swarm, uh, which became the gateway. And the gateway was a HTTP API, RESTful API, that you could submit an invocation to. It would go to the function, get you the result back, we had a CRUD API for the functions. And then at some point, I remember Patrick Shanzion at Docker said, wouldn't it be cool if you could auto-scale this? So set the replicas based upon the request count. And that's where um, Prometheus came into the picture for collecting metrics of how the functions were being invoked. An alert manager for them being able to generate an alert to the gateway to say this particular function is getting high traffic, can you scale it up a bit? And so we started to see this uh, evolve and get to the point where you could do a really good demo like the one that you'll see if you Google DockerCon 2017 and, and it was just called FAS. Little later on, you know, from my influence at ADP, you hear um, Googlers talk about technology they had at Google that they have written open source versions of, or how that's become Kubernetes. Well, for me, um, having this idea of queue workers was very popular at ADP. We did a huge amount of data processing, importing feeds, generating batch jobs and what have you. Um, and so I created something called a queue worker and that, integrated with NATS, and that's a very simple way of doing queuing compared to Kafka. Um, and it was easy for me to understand. So then we had this watchdog in every container that could make any process you wanted into a function. We then had a queue worker, so you could dequeue and NQ and dequeue requests out of band. Um, and, the, and the whole thing ran in Docker and could scale out on multiple hosts. Wow. And a lot of this development you had to kind of do on your own time, right? I mean, did you always have the idea of having this as open source from the beginning or you were just trying to solve a problem? Yes, yeah, so as a uh, complete Docker fanboy, I thought what Docker did is what everybody did. You give all of your software away for free, 
you focus on community and everything that you do and it will work out fine however uh, at some point on that journey i realized that docker had millions of dollars of vc money and kept having to get more to continue doing that i had none of that and at one of the parties that i went to at, at DockerCon, james governor from red monk came up to me and he said look what you're doing with open is uh it's incredible you know with just the community and yourself this is much bigger it has far more traction than the fn project at oracle and they've staffed that team with 40 people so so okay let's go and i'll get back forward here so vmware looks like an angel at some point because they're going to come in and let you work on this full time they're going to give you all this and then they decide to i guess abandon the project but you're still at vmware right so how does all that go no, down? i mean they abandoned you could, they abandoned me as well they're like oh we, we, we just we're not going to need uh we're not going to need you here anymore i didn't get fired um that's an important difference i like i like to think that's an important difference but they removed any need in their company for open vans right they divested it the guys and girls on my team got reallocated so they were looked after um but yeah i i was basically told um we think k native is is the future and that's still what they're pursuing now and that is fine for them other companies believe the same you know red hat has gone in with them and obviously google founded it um today if you look at even the top advocate for Knative, Ahmet Ben Alton, he's um, written a blog post, you know, did we market Knative wrong? And talked a lot about how complicated they made it, how they had so much governance in it from day one, how complex it was to understand. Um, and I think he's still really, you know, he's in love with the project and he really wants it to succeed and, and be the thing that everybody uses by default on Kubernetes and there's no question to it. For me with OpenFAS, it's slightly different we've had users in production from 2017 whether they were absolutely crazy mad to do that or not and continue to have new users on a regular basis and so i guess that is part of it it's accessible it's easy to use um it solves a problem for companies that just can't run on on cloud or the cloud services uh, aren't able to meet their needs and luckily, you retained control and rights of the project from the time you got into VMware. So you were able to literally walk away with it and continue development. So that's that's a really important um, thing. And I've heard this over and over again. Like, you, you do not want to lose rights to your software and those types of engagements. Or they could have let you go. If I'd taken the few million dollars, I would have been much better off financially. But who knows where the project would have been now. Um, and maybe I would have been doing something more profitable and maybe I would have been better off. Um, but, you know, I don't, th I, I think money and compensation is important and it's not talked about enough in open source. Uh, some people even feel uncomfortable if I mention it. Um, some of you that are listening now, but money isn't everything. And with OpenVAS, it was very much about me serving the community and serving the users. And you get a lot out of that. Uh, or I get a lot out of that. I went to my first GopherCon and did a keynote there two weeks ago, and I spoke about the OpenFAS journey over the last six years, but I actually spoke of it through the 330 people that have contributed. And in particular, there was one guy, Eric, um, who was working at Microsoft, deeply unhappy, moved team. It turned out to be a big mistake, and he was made redundant because he just, you know, it just was a bad move. And he was earning around $50,000, he doesn't mind me saying this, in Seattle. Through about a year and a half on OpenFAS, learning Go, Kubernetes, how to contribute, how to talk to people, how to really just get in there and, and get opportunities. Um, he went and got a job at Booking.com as, as an SRE for $180,000. Far more money than I was earning at ADP at the time. And there's countless stories like that where people have come in, they may be junior developers, they may not even know Go uh, through the kind of coaching and tutorage and being part of the community, being really uh, brought close, they end up getting these opportunities and going on and doing much bigger things. I, I definitely want to talk about that, but I, I want to at least stay here for one more second. So when you decide that you're going to leave VMware, we're not, you're not going to be there anymore, 
and you got your project with you, you still have to earn income even if you continue to want to work on this. So what's your next step? What, what, what did you decide to do after that? Get a full-time job and try to have enough time to work on this? I tried. I tried to go back to the people that wanted to acquire it before. I tried to go back uh, through my network and speak to people that uh, the CEOs and different people that I'd met through uh, through being a Docker captain and what have you. And there was so much uncertainty in the industry because of Knative that nobody wanted to talk, right? Or they they just wanted you to have a regular job like at ADP and that wasn't going to work for OpenFAS, right? It wasn't going to... They were basically getting a completely free aqua hire at that point and I wasn't going to entertain that thought. So I didn't have any option. I didn't have any money either other than what was in the bank. As I said to you, I went to all of the open 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 source users, the commercial users, the ones that I knew were using it heavily in production, to look. This is the scenario. Uh, you need you need to consider sponsoring the project um, or paying for some sort of support. This is what we can do. If not, uh, you're kind of biting the hand that feeds you here because open FAS that's in your production infrastructure isn't going to be maintained. It's not going to be updated. If you need something, nobody's going to be able to do it for you. You know, we need to figure this out. Deaf, deaf ears, fell on deaf ears. Uh, and I was very disappointed at that point. And I remember looking at Docker's business model and starting to really question it. How can they just focus on community all the time, helping people like Eric three, four times their salary where I don't have any income at all? No, one of the things that have never made sense to me were these kind of user user models, right? Or oh, once you get to a million users, you're you're valuable. I always ask everyone, what is your revenue rock? What is your revenue model? What is your revenue model? If I can't see a revenue model, I get I get really nervous. When it came to Caddy, the revenue model that I saw, I think, is the one that HashiCorp kind of had, which was if enough companies, if you get enough of the big enterprise companies to bring it in, at some point they're going to want some sort of service, like guaranteed service levels. And I thought at the time, let's get this let's get this product saturated to the point where the big companies almost have to have the service contracts. So talk to me now what happens. You knock down all the doors, nobody wants to support you, even the ones that are using heavily. I guess they're they're gambling that they have the feature sets they need and they don't need any other fixes. Kind of, yeah. Very short-sighted view of it. You know, even if I took them and coached them and took them to KubeCon or DockerCon to do a joint end-user talk, you know, that advanced their career and profile, they still weren't necessarily interested in uh, me having some food on the table to continue the free lunch for them, you know, using the software. And I know that's going to sound harsh to some people, and I don't mean it personally. It's just that is kind of how it was. You know, sometimes I say things how they, how they are, and that's how it was. Um, so I... I thought, okay, uh, I need to figure out what I can sell. And I started to list it down, think about skills, Docker, Kubernetes, Go, uh, training, really good at doing training in person and online, um, and marketing, right? I'd created a project from nothing that had 3,500 people in its Slack, 28,000 GitHub stars, end user companies using it in production. I knew how to talk to companies and how to to get developers to understand the value of something, how to explain a co complex subject to them in a way they could go, oh, well, now I understand how to apply it. And whilst I intended and hoped that I was going to be able to sell support on OpenFans, I couldn't, right? So instead, it ended up being um, me building a, an agency um, that gave strategy and consulting advice on marketing. I did really well out of that. I met my salary at VMware and exceeded it, uh, which was a lot of money, just through marketing with other companies, helping them understand how to approach developers, how to create content, maybe even doing some of that for them, going and doing some training for the Linux Foundation and doing official courses with them. Um, and, and over time, that has become quite a successful part of my business, but it isn't really the heart of what I want to do. It's just like me having a job at Google that pays well. You know, I still have no time for OpenFast. And so over the last probably year, even though I've been doing this for three now, 
I've really started to see people show more interest in OpenFAS Pro, closed source add-ons that you cannot get without paying for them. That is a hook for companies. HashiCorp have that as well. And then, yeah, the same as what you said, enterprise support. So enterprise companies that are like, they're saying to me, we need to go to production with this. Or we've made a corporate commercial strategic decision to use OpenFAS, uh, but we're not doing it without support. And so now I'm starting to get to that point that I wanted to be at in 2019. And I don't know why it's taken this long to get there. Maybe Knative had to sort of semi soft fail first. Maybe people had to realize that um, it wasn't just going to obliterate everything else in the landscape. But here we are. And my current target for the next year is to convert that marketing consulting revenue into licensing and support revenue. All right, we got 10 minutes left and I got too many questions. So I'm going to try to <laughs> try to target this. So my first question is, I, I, and I have a feeling that Knative probably did need to struggle and people were needing a more a, a, a simpler solution to be able to. Natch to me is one of the most simplest queuing messaging systems on the, like you just basically build it and it just works. Like I cannot never speak enough about Nats and the way they engineered that for it to work. If you've ever tried to get up Kafka or RabbitMQ or anything like that, you'll, it's not enough hours in the day, right? And so, you know, if, if your product is as is, is, is easy as Nats, that already is a huge win as compared to what's out there. But one of my questions is this, because this is something else that we struggled with Caddy. And I'm, I'm curious where, you, where, where your thoughts are here. At some point, I said to Matt, Caddy needs to be an option on every dropdown in every cloud when it comes to configuring that, right? So Caddy should be an option for your ingress or egress server. Like, it has to be there, because if it's not there, it's not, a, it's not an option. And so how do you, or how have you thought about making people know that, that the, your product exists and that it's an option? I think that's one of the hardest things here. When you have cloud with their own tech that people just will gravitate to because the tech's already there. So how do you make your, make your product an option in that kind of cloud world? Yeah, that makes, a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, first we should say about Knative that the team there that worked on it um, were Googlers. They had an incredible amount of expertise and resources they're very, very smart people. They're very nice as well in person. Um, one of them was the co-founder of Kubernetes even. And um, they built Knative to be like Kubernetes. You can configure as much as you want. We've opened for the deliberate choice of making abstractions that gave you enough of the container spec that you could still maybe run OpenFAS on Nomad or OpenFAS, we used to have it on Swarm. There's a new version that uses just ContainerD. And so that's very important. And one of the things that you get with it is that user experience, that Nats-like experience, or some people would say Linkerd to Istio. I like both projects, but Linkerd is just so much easier to use and understand. There's far fewer things it's trying to do. Um, Caddy to some extent, perhaps, I don't know, is easier to configure than Nginx for many people. So there are projects that sort of gravitate together uh, and make a lot of sense. What do you do for OpenFAS? Well, one thing that I learned with writing my ebook, Everyday Go and um, Serverless for Everyone Else, which is about OpenFAS, is that there's this thing called conversion rate. And if enough people get in your funnel, if enough people see your thing, some of them, a percentage, let's say 1%, might go on to use it. So to your point, if you could have OpenFAS as a drop down on every cloud that integrated tightly into every vendor product, perhaps a, you'd get a bigger you know, percentage of people using it, but they might actually be the wrong people. And I wanna go back to that narrative that the analysts like to bring out of winning and losing. They say, well, look, I'm, I'm not hearing about loads of OpenFAS implementations. I do hear loads of Lambda and Azure functions. Like, yeah, they're using it probably for the right job. Those things are great at glue for that specific vendor's services. If you want an S3 bucket to fire an SQS message to go to some kind of AWS log every time you, I don't know, 
turn on an EC2 instance, don't use OpenFAT. Lambda is purpose built for that. Where you do want to use it, and this is where most users come to us, is through inbound, is you've tried something, it doesn't quite do what you need, you've got a bigger payload, you've got a bigger timeout, you have a version of your software that needs to run for an enterprise customer and now you have no portability because you can't run Lambda on their servers, you're not going to go in there and install it, you can with OpenFAS. Other teams uh, like Search, work with Search, they actually use OpenFAS and EKS, the big Amazon users. Um, and they said to them, well, look, sometimes I have a hard time uh, convincing someone, especially a consultant, to use OpenFAS with a client because when they're out of the project, who's going to maintain that OpenFAS instance and keep it up to date? And they say, well, look, it's just easier for us to use Lambda, even though it's harder to set up, more complicated, harder to use, maybe has these restrictions. It's just easier that way. Amazon will support it. So it's probably not good for those use cases. And so what I want, what I probably have to work on is positioning this to the point where people clearly understand OpenFAS is not there to shake up the market and dominate over Lambda or Azure functions or Google Cloud functions or whatever. That isn't the point. We're here to serve a set of use cases and a set of users and to do a great job at that. All right, with a couple minutes we have left here, um, what does next year look at? When you think about next year, what are you hoping for for OpenFast? What are you what, what are you going to try to accomplish next year? Um, I, I think it's a, it's fantastic you found a way to keep the project alive and you're and you're working on it. But what are your kind of goals for next year? I want to see it thrive, not survive. It's taken three years, uh, and that set us back of trying to create enough closed source of value that companies will pay for it because what's for free they'll just take and take and take right so that's part one is making that better and more valuable part two is having more of those enterprise companies using open fast and paying for support which is going to enable grow the team have more people working on it um, it's actually really expensive to hire somebody or even pay a contractor full time it's very expensive you've got to close a lot of deals to even pay for one of them so what I want to do is find out what can scale, find out what problems people have. And for instance, uh, one of our end user companies really needed to move to a new kind of container builder that didn't use Docker in any way because of the way Azure had changed its structure. Um, we bought that out for them. And that's the kind of thing that goes into OpenFast Pro so that other companies that have a similar use case that can then get that instantly. And so I think if I was to start OpenFast again, like on a blank slate back in 2017, uh, I don't know if I would have done it differently, but certainly I would have needed to have thought, how am I going to get money from this? Now, nobody starts an open source project on their own, scratching their own itch, thinking of how they're going to monetize it in six years time. Right? Uh, so that's my word of warning to anybody who thinks they're an indie founder or building a SaaS or trying to go into business, companies don't pay for free. They don't pay for open source. With all companies, whether it's Red Hat or Rancher, that doesn't apply there either. They pay for commercial support or they pay for closed source features. That is really what you need to think about. We all need to kind of accept that um, and try to live with it because we can't change the way things are. It's just the way they are right now. All right, this was uh, an amazing conversation I had with you, Alex. Um, after listening, if anybody wanted to kind of reach out to you, what's the best way for people to, to contact you? So if anybody wants to kind of follow my journey, I have a weekly email uh, via GitHub sponsors and you just hear what I've been working on, whether it's OpenFAS, a new business book that I've read, a new tutorial on Go. There's my book Every Day Go as well, which is based upon what I've learned. And then um, I'm very easy to find online. If you just put Alex Ellis into a search engine, you'll probably find me. Um, send me an email if you want. Um, follow me on Twitter. Perfect, excellent. Okay, uh, again, I really appreciate your story and hearing more about OpenFast. And 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 I, you know, there's a lot of people out there building products. So these types of conversations I think are really important. I appreciate you being candid and open 
talk about uh, your journey with open source. This is Bill Kennedy and Alex Ellis signing off, thanking you for uh, spending the last hour with us and hope to see everybody again real soon.